and welcome to the live stream for T3. Um, I'm going to turn off that transcription. There we go. Cool. Um, and start sharing the screen. All right, let me know if you can't see that. You should have the sample exam um, and the form. So probably most of these Thanks, Matt. Um, probably most of these we can talk about as part of the sample exam. Um, the only thing uh, is generics where we can talk about kind of specific stuff with that, and there's a couple of questions in the sample exam. Otherwise, I'd probably just direct you to watch the week eight due recordings where we go through generics kind of as a concept. Um, otherwise, I just feel like I'd kind of repeat myself from that due. Um, and as always, feel free to ask questions throughout as we, as we talk about things. Um, but let's kind of get straight into it. So I'm just going to kind of go through both the, you know, approaching the exam, doing some of the questions. We'll probably try and get through as many of these questions as we can. Um, we might not get that. We won't, won't get through everything in two hours. This is roughly a, a three hour exam, this sample paper. Um, but we'll try and get through all what we can. And initially, um, I'm just going to run through the setup. So to set things up, download the Git bundle. I've got it here on my desktop. Um, I'm on my desktop, so I'm going to run the command uh, git clone dash b main exam sample dot bundle um, exam sample. Cool. That's not what I expected. Mm. That's really weird. OK, you run you run that command. Um, it worked fine before when I did it. Well, the actual exam had the same structure. Um, Roughly, like the exact amounts of questions won't be the exact same. Like there might be eight, uh, the, sorry, not multiple, multiple choice. Um, there might be eight short answer. There might be three programming questions. Um, it's this is a sort of general look and feel of what the exam will be like, but it's not a, you know, there won't be like question one five marks and question four three marks. It could be some other distribution. Um, I don't know why this isn't working. Upstream origin. Oh yeah, that would help. Thank you. Dot bundle. Okay, that worked. Um, and CD exam sample. And then we're going to get remote remove origin. And then we're going to re-add origin. Um, and this sets it up to point to an exam sample repo, which is sitting on uh, your GitLab. And for the actual exam, there'll be a real um, a GitLab repo, which is going to be sitting up there, which this will point to. And the reason we do this is because um, we don't want 600 people cloning a repo all at the start of the exam and potentially crashing GitLab, whereas because we just download a, this the zip here which contains the bundle and run these commands it'll it'll do it all um, and it won't actually put any load on GitLab. Okay so we set up the exam good job all right that's the first step um, then the next one is we need to open the exam and it's all one project so you can just kind of work in the same VS code environment for the entire time which is good uh, if we go to exam sample and open, and then here we go. Now this doesn't use Gradle. Um, we also aren't using JUnit, and you might have noticed this if you've had a look at the sample exam. It's just a bunch of Java tests, and if you run this main function like we do for question two here, and it doesn't crash, that means everything worked fine. Um, the reason for that is uh, in previous terms we just had problems with like some people 
didn't have JUnit working on their CSC machine. It doesn't seem to have been as much of a problem this term, um, but we're just sort of sticking with that infrastructure. It's the same thing, like you have you have asserts, you have um, tests that are functions, it's just sort of more manually run. Um, and I know people like JUnit, it's nice and clean, you get the green ticks and that sort of thing, uh, but these work pretty well as well. So that's kind of the main stuff to do with setup. Um, the only difference, and I'm probably going to update this tonight, is for the short answer, you'll have all the questions in a separate file, so like question1.md or question1.txt, question2.txt, um, rather than all just in a single file. But let's kind of go through these one by one and, and just talk about them. So question one, you're implementing a health application that monitors the heart rate of a patient. If it's out of the required range, the application needs to inform all the relevant doctors and nurses. Um, doctors and nurses responsible for a patient may change over time. What's the design pattern? And you'll and you almost definitely get a question like this in the short answer, which says, you know, here's some sort of problem. What design pattern can we use? Um, if anyone wants to like put what they think in the chat, then you're more than welcome. I know this isn't like a, a tweet, but I think it's nice to get a bit of discussion going. Um, and the key thing with these questions is there are things that will point out to you as being, okay, like this is an observed pattern which a bunch of people are saying, and they're all right. Um, because in this scenario, there's some sort of change in state. And whenever I kind of explain this, people think, oh, state pattern. Um, but it's not about the, the change in state itself. It's about, okay, well, this has occurred, this thing, you know, in this case, it's like, well, uh, like the heart rate of the, of the patient is out of the required range you know, some sort of anomalous occurrence. And so what's happening is the application is continually listening or observing, and this state, uh, this, yeah, state change happens. Oh, I was in the lectures, yeah, that, that would be it. Yeah, the state change happens. And now it says, okay, well, the observer has to, uh, all of the observers have to be notified. So in this case, the observers are the doctors and nurses, um, and these can change, this kind of relates to the, you know, attaching and detaching of observers that you kind of see in some implementations. Uh, and that's kind of it. So they're probably the two main things is this change in state, which causes a bunch of observers to be notified and uh, B, you know, you get these um, these observers which which are attached and detached. Um, Richard asked, could you explain what you would need for the full five marks? You need to write a lot to gain, you could write a small sentence. This is a good question. Um, I know like a lot of people are used to like high school where it's like, you know, this is a five mark question and you do this for one mark. And it's like you say, you know, it's like five points equals five marks. Um, some questions are sort of like that. Some aren't like um, the, the main, you know, like this question's worth five marks, which is less a case of you need to write five sentences or anything like that. It's more a case of there's five marks worth of thinking or, or sort of value to this question. And that might like three marks might come from the fact that. Um, so like for this question, just kind of looking at it. Probably two marks would come from the idea of the state change and the notifying of observers. Um, two marks would come from this idea of attaching and detaching with the doctors and nurses, and then one mark would come from the fact um, or potentially like sometimes there'd be a, another part of the question that says, well, when you're implementing this design pattern, what are some things that you have to look out for? Um, and so the, for the fifth mark, that would be, well, in this case, you can't be a doctor of yourself, right? Like you can't have this observer loop, um, which I think Ashesh talked about in the lectures. So that, that's an example breakdown. I can't really give anything that's, good, that's universally applicable, that's super helpful, because it'll just depend on how we decide the weightings for each question are sort of distributed. Um, and it's not like one of those, I don't, I don't know about, about some of you guys, but like in physics and those sorts of subjects, there'd be, you know, here's the theory question, here's the, the five things you need to write. It's like, it's kind of not like that, where you just, you get given the question and there'll be some things that we're looking for. And if your understanding kind of matches those, then you'll get the marks. Awesome, just, yeah, yeah. Cool, question two, um, same thing, pick a design pattern that's suitable. So board an application that reads data in JSON format displays the results. Um, later, we realize one of the sources is in XML, but we don't have access to the source code, so we can't actually go in and change things. What pattern could we use? This one's kind of interesting. 
Um, because I thought it was one thing, and then I checked the the answers, and it was another. So if you see the adapter, Raphael says strategy visitor adapter. Yeah, so I mean, you could argue visitor, um, and and the thing that sort of gives this away is this idea, and I'm not, it's not not actually the visitor pattern. I mean, you you could argue it, and potentially marks would be awarded for it. I feel like the question would give a bit more, um, there'd be a bit more function or more behaviour or functionality that lends itself towards saying this is a visitor. Um, the answer we had in the solutions is adapter because this idea of well you've got kind of one format and then you have some other data which is incompatible and so you need an adapter to kind of um, sit between the two and act as the, the mediator. Um, and as Guangyu says, we can't change the client code. Um, another sort of giveaway, you know, and this is a thing that says maybe it's a visitor or adapter pattern, is this idea where well, we can't actually change the source code of the application. Um, and for the visitor patterns, one kind of common use case as well, we can't go and refactor everything like we with the, uh, the calculator in week 10 we did. So we're just going to kind of put these little hooks in um, so that the thing can be visited. And then these visitor classes will actually do the, the work for us. Um, but in this case, it's adapted because you just have this, the, the key idea is there are two sort of interfaces, which in this case are data formats, and they're incompatible. Um, Question three, to be honest, like you won't get a question like this. This is just a sort of talk about design patterns because it's so, you know, it's so easy to Google and it's not really that sort of in depth. Um, but, you know, the, the decorator patterns a uh, structural pattern, which is about adding functionality to objects at runtime in a dynamic fashion that allows you to abstract. The Google is banned. Oh, yeah, exactly. We can't use Google anyway. Um, Uh, well, the same decorator pattern allows you to abstract functionality, and the builder pattern is a, a creational pattern that allows you to abstract creation of objects in a way that um, allows the kind of complex creation. That's these kinds of spot the differences questions are. Yeah, I mean, it, you probably won't get one more like this, but just talk about the decorator pattern and the builder pattern, and say, well, like in this in this case, they're completely different. So. Anyway, um, question four, which of the following statements is true? OK, so template method or template pattern. Um, let subclasses redefine an algorithm, keeping certain steps in variance. Subclasses can redefine only certain parts without changing the algorithm structure. Subclass calls the operations of the parent class and not the other way around. And template pattern works on the object level, which letting you switch behaviors at runtime. Um, can I explain? Yeah, for sure. I think that's a that's a big thing, particularly with this question. I'll talk about it with this question. Um, any thoughts on what the answer is? B. Yep. Um, there might be more than one answer. A and B. Yeah. So I reckon I reckon A and B because. The idea with the template pattern is that you have you have sort of sort of a, a series of steps or a process or an algorithm, and the at the abstract level, part of the algorithm is defined, and then part of the rest is sort of gaps that you need to fill in. It's, you know, this idea of filling in the template, um, and I think I did the same drawing in my tube, but it's like, you know, here's your here's your template class. And then it's like, okay, here's step one, and here's step two. And then step three is just an abstract method which is left undefined. And then you know, here's step four, and maybe step five is abstract as well. And so we haven't defined it at the, the superclass level what these behaviors actually mean. We just sort of kind of say where they fit into this overall process or algorithm. And then the subclasses, their job is to go and fill in the template. So okay, well, you know, we've got the rest of the steps. Now we just need to define this one and this one. Yeah, so these these kind of green ones are what you would call the hook methods. 
Cool. Um, so this is where we let the subclasses redefine, I mean, redefining parts of the algorithm, and then certain steps are invariants in the sense that they're, they're defined by the superclass and they're not changed. Um, and again, this is, you know, we only define certain parts of the behavior. The actual structure of the algorithm is all maintained in the abstract class. Sorry, my keyboard's just died. Redefining an algorithm. Um, I guess A is a bit up for, for, for ambiguous. A is a bit ambiguous because you're not really redefining the algorithm, you're just redefining parts. And in fact, you're not redefining, you're right, defining it to begin with, override a specified method. Yeah, I mean, like you could have a variation on the template pattern that's like, well, here's the step that we've we filled it in for you in the template, um, but you could potentially override this. So it's sort of like a hook method that's given a default hook. Um, sorry, my team is just having a bad day. Give me one second. Okay, should be back now. Um, yeah, let me let me double check the solutions to this one because I would say it's a bit ambiguous. Okay, yeah, I buy it. Just me. Someone has the mic on, so. Uh, do we assume C is referring to the template pattern? Yeah, yep. Yeah. This is, to be honest, just a poorly written question. It should say which of the following statements is true about the template pattern. Um, cool. Any other questions on that? Because I will talk about this idea of adding things or doing things at runtime. So, uh, I cut out for me. Yeah, it was just B. My audio was a lot clarifying. A is correct. Oh yeah, so um, it's it's not A because of this part of the phrase that's like redefine an algorithm because in the template pattern you don't redefine the algorithm. You just kind of fill in the blanks. Um. This part is correct though about key, keeping certain steps in variance because they're defined in the abstract whatever class or the thing that's kind of containing the overall process that has the template um, and then the subclass is just doing the rest of the blanks. Okay, um, so when we say, when we talk about adding things at runtime or doing things at runtime, what we mean is uh, we have this kind of polymorphic behavior Really annoying when one does this. I can't actually like zoom out at all. There it is. So let's say we have um, some sort of class. Maybe it's like this, you know, maybe we have a strategy pattern. And then here are our different strategies. And you know, these all inherit from our abstract class, which is our overarching strategy. Um, you can also apply this to the decorator pattern, any sort of pattern that's related to changing behaviors at runtime. So strategy and decorator are the main two that we talk about. Um, and then this is the class that uses it. So it has like some sort of composition. Here's a little diamond. And inside this class, we go, okay, well, you know, maybe it's like a, a chess game. And we have, so we have, you know, private strategy uh, chess strategy, and then in here, this is called chess strategy. 
And so the user of the chess strategy says, well, okay, at any given point, I'm just going to say strategy dot make move. And you know, this has a, a make move method, maybe it's abstract. And these uh, concrete classes go and define it. Like this. So when we kind of talk about this idea of at runtime, we don't know what strategy actually is until we run the code, because it could be any of these three concrete implementations. Like it won't be this abstract class here, because you can't instantiate an abstract class. Um, the polymorphic type, which is the thing that we've defined it as in this, you know, maybe it's called, it's called the game class or the chess game. The polymorphic type is, well, this is a chess strategy, but when we get to actually doing it at runtime, it's not going to be chess strategy because you can't do that. It's going to be, you know, one of these like, I don't know what chess strategies there are, but you know, it might be A, B, or C. And so at runtime, this strategy variable will be an A, or it'll be a B, or it'll be a C. And the idea with inheritance, obviously, is that it doesn't matter, right? Because you know that every single thing that this could be will implement the make move method. And the behavior of that's going to change depending on what it actually is. So it'll be different if it's an A to the, you know, to if it's a B to if it's a C. Um, and this idea of kind of at runtime means, well, whatever it is under the hood, we'll know when it gets to runtime and we don't need to know beforehand. And this is the idea with like the strategy pattern and the decorator pattern where you don't, you don't know what this thing will be. And like, you know, if this was a decorator instead, we'd just say decorator dot make move and then that might be um you know that might be like a decorator class or it might be a base class like if you think back to kind of tute nine when we did the 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 armors and the helmet and all that sort of thing you can kind of have as many things wrapped up as you like and the the functionality you know like the the code doesn't really care because it just calls the subsequent methods um whereas with the template pattern you know that it's going to be A or B or C, and it's not going to change. So we can still use this kind of polymorphic behavior where it's like, well, um, you know, you call strategy dot make move, but we don't kind of, you know, and this is the difference between template and strategy. We don't have this idea of, well, maybe, you know, we start out with an A, but then maybe later we can change it to be a B, and then later we can go back to an A. So that's the sort of static dynamic um, difference. It's basically strategy switch behavior at runtime and decorator add behavior at runtime. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Um, no chess piece types can change movement strategy though. No, I said, oh no, I meant this is like like if you were writing a chess AI. Um, and the other thing with chess is like, you know how a pawn can become a queen at the end of the, like if you know, you move much to the end of the board, it's like, well, that's a strategy pattern because you can change like what piece you are at runtime. Yep. Cool. All right. So, uh, question five. Now, this is a question from last term when we used to have Java effects in the course, which we don't anymore. Um, so you wouldn't get asked a question like this. This is more just like a um, an interesting like design, I guess, thing to think about. Because um, basically how Java effects worked was you'd have the you'd have the front end and you'd have your controller and your controller kind of contained a lot of front end code. Uh, or when I say front end code, I mean that's like code that relates to what happens on your front end. And it'd do this whole interaction between the back end model and the front end, but it'd often be quite complex. And what you'd also have in this this lab in particular is these things like rather than like I don't know if many of you are familiar with the game of life. Probably bring it up, game of life, Conway. You know, it's like this game where you start out with some squares and then you press play and then it does that. So they had to make this in Java effect. Um, and all it is is a big grid with a bunch of squares and it's either true or false, you know, the, the lights on or the lights off. And so we represented that um, with a series, you think, oh, well, you know, you just have a series of booleans, right? Rather than that, we had a series of Boolean properties, which are these special objects that essentially allow you to have 
uh, something that's in your model. Let me make a new page. Let's say you've got your, your grid of, you know, that's your game of life grid, and this is what's in your back end model. And you know, here we go, it's like four, five by five. And then that would, you know, this is your back end, and then that would correspond to something on the front end that's being actually shown to the user. And how it would work is you have this sort of bi directional coupling that says, well, Whenever the user decides to, you know, tick this box, that'll automatically use the observer pattern to update this, and this will be set to true. And similarly, if I, in the back end, set this to false, then that'll automatically update in the front end. And this is just an observer pattern under the hood. Um, so that's kind of how it works. The question is, what's, um, but there's a code smell, which, Hopefully you can spot this is just like a really, you know, comp one five one one level kind of thing. Um, but then there's a the other part of the question is what's the big big design smell here? Um, does anyone want to take a, a stab at either? Single responsibility. Uh, I don't think that's being violated here. So in terms of the code smell, um, we just have the number 10 repeated, which is a magic number. And that's pretty straightforward. In terms of the design smell, um, and this is a problem with Java effects as a whole, is your back end is reliant on the front end in the sense that you know we have this 2d array of boolean property objects but that's dependent on how we've gone and implemented the front end yeah and as matthew says too tightly coupled so you have this kind of front end back end coupling and, and like you guys know this from the the project where um the whole idea is that well you didn't even have to write the front end like we did that for you so you can't have coupling because you know like we we obviously can't write you know 140 front ends um and, you know, like, same as what you're kind of used to from a lot of courses is we just define a common interface and you write your code to that interface. Um, that's why we use Spark. Yeah. So that's the kind of design smell. Um, and this is, yeah, and again, these kind of concepts aren't, you know, just like, Here's this, you know, class X and class Y, you know, where's the coupling? It's like, well, this is a, this is coupling on a kind of broader scale, and we want you to sort of appreciate that kind of thing as well. All right, uh, question six. Oh yeah, this question. Um, this was just a. This is kind of relating to the kind of OO and software engineering and process side of things. Um, the answer to this question is kind of in the week five lecture on programming the large where. You know, we talk about the big design up front and the incremental design, and they're the two sort of methodologies it, it combines, where you still want to kind of have an idea of what you're doing before you start development, um, but you don't do every, you don't have to get everything perfect before you begin. Um, question seven, generics. So, does anyone think this is right? Yeah, that's incorrect. Um, because the thing that's parameterized, the thing that's parameterized doesn't get, doesn't kind of follow the rules of inheritance. Like it doesn't, you know, the thing that's actually, the actual object will, you know, follow inheritance like normal, but the thing that's inside the angle brackets is, is its own thing via a composition. Uh, can question six potentially be, be asked in the exam? Uh, I mean, we've kind of asked in the sample exam, so we wouldn't ask this question verbatim but I guess something similar could be asked. So part B then, okay, well list question mark matches list object and this integer. This is correct because 
when we talk about question marks, we just say, well, this, this is a wild card. This can match anything, um, which means it can match object. It can also match integer. The wild card question mark extends foo, matches foo, and any subtype. Uh, yeah, something similar. Yeah, you could be asked something similar. Uh, and then this one, so okay, so D's wrong and C's right because um, if we want to say something and anything that's higher in the sort of inheritance hierarchy, we'd say question mark super foo and then extends foo, you know, obviously extends inheritance, so any subtype of foo and foo itself. Um, and that's the, sorry, that's not all the short answer. We've still got like two questions left. Yeah, as most of the short answer um, was B right. Minus marks for wrong answers. Um, I don't think we give you a breakdown on the exact marking of the short answer. It won't be anything brutal like, you know, um, you get, you know, there's, like, there's multiple correct answers and you get zero if you don't get them all. Like you get partial marks for answering questions correctly, you know, getting part of it right. Um, and yeah, you potentially lose partial marks for having, you know, like you, there were two correct and you selected three or something. You assume you always feel incentivized to stop answering. There is more than one. Yep. Um, question three is just a basic kind of inheritance and polymorphism question where, and this is again the whole idea of this thing of at runtime, where the static type of animal, this animal variable here is animal, because that's what we've said on the left hand side. Um, but when we actually get to running the code, it's going to be a dog, because that's what we've said. Um, and so under the hood, Java goes, OK, well, I know that I need to run this method. And so it prints wolf wolf. All right, question nine. Um, this is a this is probably going to take me like twenty minutes to explain because it's just there's a lot going on. Um, but I think it's worth talking about. So this is to do with design by contract and the list of substitution principle. Uh, and the question is, well, okay, so we've got this flight class, and the preconditions are age must be greater than or equal to zero, and name does not contain any spaces. And the post conditions are, well, the flight is booked. Okay, okay that's, that's great. Um, no, not necessarily. So then, okay, we now have this other kind of class which extends flight, called a gold flight, and then the preconditions have changed. So we say that age is greater than or equal to 50, and the post conditions say, well, the flight is booked. So the post conditions are the same, and then the method prototype is the same. So the question is, is this valid inheritance? Um, this question this was in last term's exam, and lots of people kind of messed it up because uh, they didn't understand the Liskov substitution principle and designed by contract. So um, I think someone asked to talk about design by contract briefly, so we can do that. The essential idea is, you know, let's say let's say that we go with the classic flight example. It's like, well, you know. Um, Let's get a Qantas flight to uh, Melbourne. And so you go buy your ticket and they say, okay, well, the preconditions are you have to be at the airport on time. You have to bring your ticket. And, you know, you have to check in your luggage and stuff go through security. I mean, you know, this is satisfied by virtue of being at the airport on time because, you know, you have to be at the terminal, but you get the idea. And the post conditions are you are in Melbourne. So this is what they guarantee. And then this is what we, as the client of the abstract data type, have to guarantee. And if we don't meet the preconditions, then all bets are off. Because it's like, well, if you didn't rock up to the airport on time, then you know, that's that's the you problem. They're, they're not going to come and you know, fish you out of your home. And this is a, you know, like a general example, but it's the same thing in code. So uh, I think the week four tube is, you know, where we do the calculator and it's like, well, if you pass in zero, then you violated the preconditions. So you have this divide function. 
it's like, well, the preconditions, it takes in you know, int A and int B. The preconditions are B can't be zero. And if you break that, then anything could happen. It could work, it could throw an exception, you could get a seg fault, the whole computer could explode. The, the behavior of the abstract data type is undefined. Um, but if you do meet the preconditions, then it's on the function or the this thing you're using, the abstract data type, to meet the post conditions, which in this case is A over B. So that's designed by contract as a kind of general principle. When we start introducing inheritance, things get a bit weird because now you've got this idea of, well, this is what my superclass did, and now this is what I have to do. Um, and I guess the way to think about it is like, you know, here's your uh, you know, here's your preconditions and like here's your post conditions. And it's like a little funnel. And so what happens is, well, okay. The preconditions are things that the client has to do. And post conditions are the thing that we as the writer of the ADT have to do. And then, you know, think of like this stuff here as being functionality. So if we strengthen the preconditions, what we're saying is the client has to do more. Not us, the client. Um, uh, let's make this um, green. Oops. If we strengthen the post conditions, that says we have to do more. As this function, this class, whatever. And the same thing is true when you flip both. So, okay, if we strengthen the preconditions, the client has to do more. But if we weaken the preconditions, oops, that means we have to do more. Because now it's like, well, there are less, um, like let's say with this plain example, it's like, well, actually the name could not contain any spaces. And it's like, maybe, maybe our function relied on the fact that, you know, you had a space in your name so it can split the name up or something like that. Um, and when we weaken that and we take that away, that means we have to deal with it as the ADT. Similarly, um, if we decide to weaken the post conditions, now that's saying like, you know, I mean, it's like you're on, you're on a flight and it's like, okay, well now we're not gonna give you a, a crappy meal. So you have to go feed yourself. And so we as the, you know, well, the person who's catching the plane has to go and, um, you know, do that themselves. So uh, the client has to do more. You think, okay, this this kind of makes sense. Um, what has this got to do with the Liskov substitution principle, which um, for those of you who have forgotten, uh, that says all subtypes must be substitutable for their base types. And what that means is in this case, we should be able to say something like this. We should be able to say uh, flight, flight equals new goal flight. Or we could, we could do what we did in the animal example where it's like goal flight f equals new. And then, I don't know, flight f prime equals f. And then we should be able to say f dot uh, f prime Dot, what is it? Book. And then you think, well, okay, we know that this is a uh, we know this is a flight, right? Because that's statically what we said the type was. Um, and you think, well, okay, the age should be greater than or equal to zero. So maybe the you know I'm going to say I'm 18, and uh, the name does not contain any spaces. So anyway. And you think, well, that, that should work, right? But does it work?
if you look back at what the preconditions and the post conditions of being a gold flight are. No, it doesn't. Because at runtime, the dynamic type of this thing is a gold flight. And that has the preconditions. Well, you actually have to have the age greater than or equal to 50. The problem is we don't know that because um, we just thought it was a normal flight. And LSP says you should be able to substitute the base type, which is gold flight, for the super type, which is light. And it should maintain the same behavior. But it doesn't because when we weaken the preconditions, sorry, no, when we strengthen the preconditions, now actually all the client has to do this. But we didn't, you know, like the client doesn't know that. Um, so this breaks the list of substitution principle and means that the inheritance is invalid. The kind of breakdown that I just gave is like, if you said that in like three sentences, that would get you full marks to this question. Um, and that, you know, these are all kind of the key points that we're expecting where it's like, well, you know, if you, you can't, um, you can't strengthen the preconditions because that would violate LSP because if you strengthen the preconditions, um, then trying to substitute for the base type Sorry, yes, trying to substitute the subtype for the base type causes behavior to be undefined. Um, and so it's not valid inheritance. Does that make sense to everyone? Um, minus, uh, yeah, so you can't strengthen pre or we can post. Yep, awesome. Um, Cool, We've got 15 minutes to the hour. We'll take a break in 15 minutes and then keep going. Uh, and that's the end of the short answer. So, probably the biggest, just like general advice about short answer is think about, you know, particularly for questions like choose a design pattern, think about what pattern you're going to use um, and just spend time to go over the questions. And like, even if that's, you know, you do the questions sort of in, you know, you do them fast at the start and then you come back to them at the end, just as long as you have time to think about it and you don't just kind of make a snap decision and then never sort of visit it again. Because um, some of these questions just take time to think about. Uh, so you can strengthen post and weaken preconditions. Strengthen post. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So if you weaken the preconditions, all that means is the abstract data type has to do more. So if you pass in the same stuff, you feel like, well, I'm going to say f prime dot book, uh, you know, like let's say let's say the the preconditions were weakened to be where are we? Like we took away the age is greater than zero, so it's just like the name does not contain any spaces. Then we're still treating treating this like it's a superclass, so we still adhere to that. But we didn't actually have to, and so it doesn't even matter. Um, the first practical is a combination of generics and composite. So the first kind of practical question, it wouldn't necessarily be composite, like this example is composite. Um, there will be a question in the programming section that requires you to use generics. Both questions will require you to use some sort of design pattern at some point. Um, the main kind of difference between potential different questions is you'll have one that's like, um, you, you'll get given a controller for both. And one will be, you have a little bit of starter code and have to pretty much do everything from scratch. And you have to like solve some problem. And then the other question will be, here's some existing code that passes a series of tests, um, but the code has some design smells, it has some problems in it. So you've got to fix the design smells, maybe use a design pattern to do that. You kind of refactor to patterns and then uh, we're going to throw some new requirements at you, you know, like what you used to from the project, and then you have to extend the your solution that you've refactored to include those. Um, so, like, it won't necessarily be any particular pattern. And part of the, and this is a big thing with these questions, is, is the whole idea is you've got to choose the the right pattern because if you choose the wrong pattern, um, it'll it'll take longer. It, but yeah, that's the main thing. Like. You just spend a couple of minutes at the, you know, at the start of the question thinking, okay, well, here's this is the problem. Like, 
what pattern am I going to use? Again, same as like when you're doing the short answer, it's like what are the key things that stand out and say, okay, well, maybe I'll use Observer here, maybe it's Adapter. Because um, then once you start implementing it, it's like, okay, well, you just sort of have to not quite follow the recipe as we'll see with this question, but it's like you're, you kind of have the, the, the broad strokes ideas laid out for you and you just need to figure out, okay, well, how does this problem, um, or how does this pattern apply to this problem? And you're finding that like, oh, I can't get this particular, you know, this this doesn't work. Like I'm trying to use a strategy pattern and, you know, I can't I can't change strategies at runtime. That's like, well, okay, maybe it's not a strategy pattern. Um, so that's why that kind of decision making process is important. Is design more important than correctness? Uh, the marks for both. So like each question will have marks for correctness, like do you pass auto tests and marks for design, which will be a marker going through and looking at your code. Um, I wouldn't say like one's more important than the other. Like in terms of in terms of doing it, it's like you want to focus on the design at the start, and if you have good design, you're you're more likely to write correct code. Um, yep, I'm not manually marking more, thankfully, but we'll go through each yeah each programming question and mark the design because that's I mean that's what's really about. Like this isn't this isn't one of those early comp courses where it's just like, do you pass the question? Because we just give you lots of little like you know an Andrew Taylor exam where it's like add two numbers in MIPS. Um, but you know we want to see like, can you do this properly? Um, how complex would the practical questions be? I mean, like this business rules question is relatively complex. I don't think it'd be kind of conceptually more complex than that. Um, I'd say the main difference, like structurally, is there'll be sort of multiple parts to each question, like this refactoring one. You know, it's like, well, we talk about the design smells, refactor the code, and then you'd also have a part that's like, well, okay, you've refactored it, now add some new requirements. Um, so just like quite quite multi-part, and then the point of that is to give you opportunities to get marks, because it's like, rather than, you know, one big block where it's like, either you get it all or you don't, it's, you can get, you know, chunks and, and kind of tick things off as you go, which is really helpful. Um, I got sidetracked, but um, I think I was just talking about this programming question. Um, this kind of question, I I sat down to do it um, when, I, when I first looked at it, and it's kind of it's it's initially a question that you're like, I don't know what's going on. I need to, you know, you just need to like sit down and, um, especially in the exam, like take a deep breath and and sort of work through what's there, um, and so immediately. You know, it's like, okay, well, there's this or stuff, and it's like, well, we did that in the lab, and that kind of makes sense. But then we've got these these other operators, and we've got these lookup things. Okay, what, what does that all mean? So part of like part of this whole idea is you, you really look like got to use your kind of critical thinking to pull things together. Um, I'm not going to go through using the enum just because we don't really talk about enums, and you can use the composite pattern for this one pretty easily without it. Uh, the first, we'll probably, I'll use the composite pattern first and then talk about the JSON. Um, yeah, I don't know if we're going to get to the, the shopping one because this might take a while. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the question broadly and then we'll take a break and then we'll go and write some code. So to start with, like, what, what, is all, what do all these sort of operators mean and how, how, does this, how does the structure fit together? Binaries? Uh, sorry, Alan, I'm not sure what the question is. That's not what I expected. Um, okay, so let's take this one example here. Um, if we were to represent this as a tree, think, okay, well, let's start with this. We've got this OR operator. Then within that, we have two arguments. We have the not blank. And we have another not blank. And then the not blank has one subnode within it, and this one is a, a lookup, and then this one also is a lookup. Um, 
Okay. So conceptually, it's like, well, we've got these four nodes and they have two subnodes, just like in lab seven. And then we have these not blank nodes and they only have one subnode. And so, okay, well, that could be a lookup. Then let's look at the second example. Where we've got a similar thing. We have an AND node at the top, then we have this greater than operator, and we have another OR node on the other side. And in the OR node is a NOT blank and a NOT blank. And in the AND node is uh, the other greater than, and within that is a lookup and a constant. OK, so there's this new thing of a constant. And it's sort of a little bit like an SQL query where it's like we've got this you know, thing which we've got to look up and a constant, which in this case is two. Uh, so this is greater than, and this is or. So what we'll have to do, um, same as in lab seven, is model this using the composite pattern. And the good thing, at least I think, with the composite pattern is you can kind of think, okay, I don't have to worry too much about all this really complex stuff. I can just focus on, well, I'm going to implement the AND operator, and that just needs to, just needs to say, evaluate the left, get whatever that is, evaluate the right, get whatever that is, and AND them together. And that's really easy. That's one line of code. Cool. And then it's like, okay, well, the OR operator, same thing with an OR expression. With the greater than, okay, well, we've got to evaluate the left and evaluate the right and see if one's greater than the other. Um, so you can really kind of break this sort of problem that's, that seems very complex and, and convoluted down to a series of very simple steps. Um, and that's probably the, the best way to approach these sorts of questions. Milestone to goal code, yep. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's a composite pattern with logic operators. Um, yeah, so that's uh, on these. These two not blanks contain two things. They both contain lookups. And that's our tree. So now we just have to A, model this using the composite pattern, and then B, we have to construct this. And we'll probably use some sort of factory style pattern to do the creation. Um, again, I don't know if it was a challenge exercise, but one of the exercises in Lab 7 is quite similar. Um, and we'll do that using JSON. So let's take a five, six minute break now. We'll come back at about five past, uh, yeah, five past four, and then get into writing some code. So let's see you soon.
Um, try doing it now. Try to access the questions now because I've just switched it from being private to internal. So everyone should have access. Actually, it might not have worked. Still having problems. Okay. Um, internal. Ah, oh, here we go. I've got to your save. Okay, now it should work. So if you have access to the content repo, you should have access to that sample exam, uh, sample questions. Cool. All right. Um, thanks for that. So let's crack on and write some some code for this business rules question. Um, and we'll do it inside a subfolder. We'll call this uh, composite. Oops. And let's just kind of go through and and write all these classes. I normally would recommend, you know, you do it incrementally and get little bits working, but because this all kind of fits together to evaluate, you know, rules at a time, it's like we kind of just might as well do everything in one go. And the um, the stuff's relatively simple in the sense that, you know, if there's a problem, we can there's there aren't too many lines of code to kind of dig through. Um, so let's just code it up and then see what happens. Um, so we'll call this and operator to start with. I mean, if you've done the goals for milestone two and lab seven, you've probably done this kind of thing to death now where it's like, well, our and is going to have private business rule, rule one, and same thing for rule two. And this is going to implement business rule. So we're going to have to implement this evaluate method, and then we'll say return rule one and rule two. Can't the ends in this instance have more than Oh, that's a good question. Uh, group operators. Hmm. Yeah, you might be right. True. Uh, operators. I don't think the question specifies. Oh no, here we go. Evaluates the two business rules applied. So yeah, it's always two. That's a cool question though. Will the solutions be uploaded? Yep, they, I think what we'll do is we'll put them in the in a solution branch in your repos. That might be different though. We'll probably put something on the forum. Uh, did you have to check this case of the project? No, we never gave you like, uh, like an and goal with three things. Um, so that's, that's the end, and then we just need to write a constructor. Okay, that's end, and then, I mean, I don't normally don't like copy and pasting code, but we can pretty much just do that and then change this to say all operator and change that and then just change this to an or okay bang that's two and then now there are kind of composite logic operators and now we've got these composite sort of you know things that's like the greater than or or not blank so we'll call this uh, greater than operator dot java and that's also going to implement business rule. And now we have this interesting kind of conundrum design wise. It's like, well, normally with a composite pattern, we'd contain a business rule. But if we look at the sample input, it's like, well, this isn't, is this a business rule? And it's not really a business rule because A, it doesn't contain, I mean, you know, all it contains is this string field so it's gonna be difficult to pass and you know it's not conceptually a it's not conceptually containing a compound compound node and this is you know this is where 
this example diverges from what you've done in previous you know, instances of the composite pattern slightly because um, the greater than operator and the not blank operator will always contain leaf nodes. Whereas before it's like, well, you could have and or or and you could have compound nodes within that and it's all just, you know, you can go as many layers deep as you like. But here, the greater than operator can only work on two concrete values. So these are going to have to be some sort of leaf nodes. And we'll call these, uh, what should we call these? We'll call them, um, yeah, we'll just call them like a value. Oh, I don't call it value, no, value, yeah, business rule value, that's same. And that's just going to be another interface. And so this is going to have an evaluate method, but it doesn't return a boolean, it's going to return an object. And that's going to take in the same thing here, it takes in this map, and so this is helpful because that way we're not returning true or false. We can return something that's useful for uh, our greater than operator or our not blank operator that says, okay, given this thing that, that's being composed here, I want to evaluate that and check that it's greater than something else. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Let's say private uh, business rule value. Uh, B1, and then value 2, and then the constructor will just take in two of those. things get interesting type-wise and I think, uh, I think it was Guang before yeah was talking about how do we deal with this you know like type casting and stuff because it's a bit, bit yucky um, and you know because it's like well this evaluate method will return an object and in the spec it's, it says what does it say you can return a double or a string um, the thing with this one, I think, and this is just a mistake in the question, is the test you integers. So let's kind of simplify things and say, well, we can uh, return strings or integers. That doesn't really, that doesn't simplify the typecasting as such because we don't know what this is going to return. It's going to be a type object. So we're going to need to do a bit of, a bit of type checking inside this uh, operator to validate what we've got. And if you look here inside this enum, it should throw a business rule exception if A or B isn't an integer or a, um, or a double or, yeah, so if it is an integer or if B isn't specified. Um, what we'll do is like, we'll, we'll just check that it's a number and then typecast it to an integer for simplicity sake. Um, or if B isn't applied. Sorry, someone's got their mic on. I'm just going to mute you. Oh, you muted yourself. Good job. Um, or if B isn't supplied. Okay. And then we're just going to check the evaluation. So in here we'll say um, object V1 equals value 1 dot evaluate with the values we're given. And same thing for V2. And then we'll say if V or not V1 instance of number or not V2 instance of number, we'll just return false. Oh, sorry, not we're return false. We're going to throw new business rule exception. And then otherwise, we're going to cast them. 
because we've done this check so we can have kind of some type safety that we know whatever we're going to be casting is going to be uh, convertible to a number or an integer. So we just say return integer b1 dot, uh, yep, b1 dot, sorry, b1 greater than b2. And then that's all happy. Oh yeah, value two, thanks. Oh dear. Um, that's better. Okay. Now let's do the not blank operator. Which is going to follow a similar pattern. That's the implement business rule. And oops, that's not what I wanted, sorry. This is going to contain a single node, and it's going to be a uh, what's going to be business rule value value, and then what we'll say is object val equals value dot evaluate with values and then we'll firstly check if val uh, equals null return false and then otherwise we will say uh, return uh, string val dot is full oh thanks sorry we have to make another variable here called string Does a typecast. And then we can call the is empty method. Uh, sorry, no, is blank, and that will check if it's blank. And that's all of our compound nodes. So now we need to go and do our sort of leaf nodes, which are lookup and constant. So we'll call this lookup. Um, Lookup value dot Java, and that is going to implement our business rule value. So these are this is the equivalent of a leaf node, and then all this is going to do because we have the thing to look up in the map. Um, so we just kind of are going to store the key. We say private string key and a constructor. And then all we need to do here is say return values dot get key. And if the because part of the question says, well, you know, if um, if it doesn't look up, like if you if we get given these values and we don't actually, you know, like we say, look up the the word Bob, and the values don't contain that, then it will say, well, this is this is blank, and then the the not blank operator will return true. Um, so all we're just going to say is, well, we're going to return get key, and if this is uh, not in the map, it'll say, um, yeah, returns the value. Oh, sorry, returns the value to which the specified key is mapped or null if it contains no mapping. So this will return null, and then not blank will look at it and go, okay, well, you obviously didn't contain the key. Um, and then that's. Everything but one operator, which is constant value dot Java, which implements uh, business rule value, and this is just going to be, uh, let's say, an integer. And we'll just we're not even going to use the values in this case because, um, oh yeah, sorry, that should be not valid, is blank. Um, we're not even going to use the values we're passed in this case because it's a constant. It's not going to vary depending on 
the values we're given. So we just say return value. And then constructor. And then I think that's all of our compound and leaf classes. I probably missed something which we can figure out as we run the tests. Um, but that's the composite pattern part of the question. And so, you know, like in probably in the exam, this would be you know, like part part A or whatever. Um, and then part B would be okay, well now we've got to implement the passing of the nodes from JSON. So that is what gets done in this business rule main class. Um, and you can see in the test, we just read in a JSON file, turn it into a string, and then call business rule main dot generate rule. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a helper private uh, yeah, we'll make it public. I'm going to make a helper function which takes in a JSON object because JSON objects are not a lot nicer to deal with than strings. Uh, so I'll say public static business rule generate rule from JSON. That's going to take in JSON object input business rule. Uh, we're going to need to import this. So um, if you're familiar with JSON, then we've given it to you to use. If you didn't use it in the project, then you don't really have to worry about it. It's just another option that's there. Um, the default org.json library is absolutely fine. Um, and a question that you get in the exam, or like part of a question that will require you to pass some JSON, can be done in a pretty similar way to, uh, to what we're about to do here. So what's going to happen is I'm just going to say return um, generate rule from JSON and then just convert uh, we'll turn this into a JSON object by creating a new um, instance. And what this will do is it'll take the string and just pass it and turn it into a JSON object, which is really helpful. And now we need to actually actually do the the JSONifying, um, and we can do this recursively, which makes it nice and clean. So what we will say, um, if we look at the input we're given it's a bit finicky because the, the parameters aren't necessarily consistently named because we've got we've got operator that's always consistent and then it's sometimes arg or args so probably just do it in if statement i think let's see um we'll start with string operator equals input business rule dot get string and operator and then i say if operator dot equals um, we'll start with the easy cases so like and I'm going to return new and operator and then say generate rule from JSON um, get the left and get the right so let's figure out the arguments say JSON array args equals uh, uh, input business rule dot get JSON array, I think. Yep. Args. And then we're going to need to import that. And then we can just say args zero and args one. Hmm, and operator cannot be resolved to a type. That's because we haven't imported it. No. Hmm. Import uh, part two q one dot composite. Okay, cool. Oh, and of course I'm in Java, which doesn't support indexing, so I have to say dot get. I find it super weird that Java just doesn't let you index it an array list like like normal. Um, 
doesn't take in an object. Oh, okay. So this is this is annoying because JSON arrays just you know like we can't say a JSON array parameterized on the JSON object. It doesn't like that for some reason. So we have to do some typecasting, which is a bit ugly, but oops. it kind of gets us where we need to. So I just need to convert this to a JSON object. And the constructor is not visible. That's because I made it private. Excellent. So that's the end case. Um, else if operator dot equals or um, get the args and same thing, we'll return a new or operator. I don't particularly like how like args is repeated and normally you'd abstract that, but the problem is we can't rely on that being the case for all the operators, so we'll just sort of bite the bullet here and repeat like two lines of code. I don't know why I made these constructors private. Okay, um, next one, greater than. Uh, we will say, this one we get args again, because we're given two things to compare. So we'll return new greater than operator. And we can just copy this, because I can't be bothered typing it out again. Maybe you can use arg. Oh, oh, clever, okay. Oh. Thank you, that's super helpful. I didn't know that existed. Um, hang on, I'm just gonna try and... The power of reading the documentation. Okay, so I know what's going on. Now we can't actually call recursively again because we're not generating a business rule, we're generating a business rule value. So we're gonna write another function that says public static business rule value, um, generate rule value from JSON. That takes in just a JSON object. And now we have to I'm just trying to figure out why it says generate rule from JSON args. Oh, that should be rule value. There we go. Great. So now we just need to say, given a rule value, which in this case is lookup or constant, generate the JSON. And we can do the same thing, I think. Yeah, the operator is lookup or constant. And we'll say string arg equals um, value dot get string arg. Actually, it's not going to be get string, it's going to be get object. So we just say get and then what we'll do is return, uh, well, if operator is going to be lookup, we'll return new lookup operator. Sorry, lookup value. And the key is arg. And we're just going to type cut that's type cast that to a string. And else if operator dot equals um, constant return new constant value. 
which takes in an integer and then our sort of base case is return null, but we should never get to that. Um, so that's all of our leaf nodes. And then if we are given a, what is it, not blank? Yeah, not blank. This one only takes in a single arg. And we'll return a new uh, not blank operator, which for some reason doesn't have a constructor because we didn't have one. So we add the constructor, and that's all good. And then this complains. Uh, arg, we need to say that should be generate rule value from JSON, and then we pass in the arg to that. Otherwise, return null. The constructor not blank operator business rule value is undefined. Hmm. Really? No, I didn't say that. Okay. I think that is everything we need, but let's run it and see what happens. Was expecting true, but got false. Okay, so the good news is it doesn't, you know, completely crash and burn. Um, and this is, you know, like, once you kind of get past some basic compile errors and things that cause, you know, crash because of null pointer exceptions or it can't pass the JSON or whatever, um, this is a point when you when you know you're just you know, dealing with the logic. Um, was expecting true but got false. Business rules test line 40. So that's here, okay. Um, line 35 is where it's called. So we failed this assert statement. Um, has responses and either phone number or email evaluate okay uh, what's the rule so this says false when should say true um, okay what's going wrong This is the first example. Example two, okay. Imagine not using <laughs> the problem a problem is figuring out what is actually failing. Um I think VS code's the right debugging. I think it might say v2 equals v1 dot evaluate somewhere. It probably does because we copied and pasted code, and this is why you don't copy and paste code. Um, where are the breakpoints then? Uh, when we use them, everything is get zero. Ah, okay, that would be why. Yes. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, Okay, zero, zero, one. All right, so now that should work, hopefully. It 
see that these, these are our breakpoints. Um, I'm going to take that off though. Okay, it didn't crash and burn, and I'll just run that again. Great, so all the tests passed, which means the question's finished. Um, thanks, Jordan, for finding the bug. That's a good spot. Um, but yeah, like for, in terms of debugging during the exam, breakpoints are definitely the way to go. Um, I mean, like print statements are, are useful, but really, like you just want to be able to figure out what's going on and try to figure out figure it out fast. Uh, that's the business rules question kind of wrapped up. Um, I've probably missed an edge case or two, and you will in the in these sort in the questions where it's like build most of the system from scratch will give you a basic kind of sanity test. This is quite a good test because it covers quite a like a broad range of cases. Um, we'll give you tests kind of like what we did for milestone three, where it's like here's a here's a test to make sure your, your code compiles and isn't kind of completely cooked. The rest is is up to you to test. Um, and that includes edge cases and that sort of thing. So that's question one, and we've got 20 minutes left, which is actually, I reckon, enough time to talk about question two, and goes back to what we were discussing at the start, which is the template pattern. Um, I kind of just gave it away. Which I probably shouldn't have said that, but well, here's some code, and you immediately look at this and you're like, oh, this is, this is some crap code, because we've got all this checking for equals, uh, we've got all these if statements, and they're the, the probably the biggest code smells. And the first part of the question is, well, what are the design and code smells that are present here? And that's the main one. We've got a lot of kind of, you know, this this double if statement where it's like you could just say if this and this. Um, lots of magic numbers, like what does 55 mean? What does 20 mean? Um, I think they're the main ones. Yeah. The one redeeming feature of this piece of code is that all the tests pass. And for the refactoring question, it's important that you can refactor, you can change the code, but the tests remain passing because the idea of refactoring is that the behavior of the, you know, the external behavior of the system doesn't change. Um, what we're going to do here is we might not get time to do it all, but we'll use a template pattern to refactor this and make it a bit nicer. Now, how, how do we get to a template pattern? Well, you can kind of tell because we've got all these steps. We will welcome the user, this is you know, step one. Step two is scan the item. Step three is take the user's payment. And what you notice is that some steps will vary depending on, like this question, I should have probably read that at the start, but you know, we've got this checkout system and uh, you can have like a Coles checkout or a Woolies checkout. And a lot of the steps of the process are quite similar. Like this scan items function is just one function that checks. Oh no, the scan items depends on the implementation as well. But there's some steps of the process which are universal and then some steps which are reliant on a concrete, you know, is this Coles or is this Woolies? And rather than putting it in an if statement, we can use inheritance. And a template pattern. So let's call this um, supermarket.java to start with. And it'll be an abstract class. And what we're going to do is kind of take this checkout method, copy that, and paste it. And yeah, implement for calls and woolies. And I think we've got an amount purchased and we've got a name as well. I guess you could actually, sorry, I'm going to go back on that. We can get rid of this supermarket file. I'm just going to call back the checkout system. Um, so this is our overarching abstract class. Can we do that? No, we can't. We can't make it abstract because we need to create a new instance of it. This is just mainly for testing purposes, but. OK, um, strategy pattern. What are the sort of key characteristics of this problem that you think lend towards being a strategy pattern? Should 
twisted man classes, yeah, for sure. Most of the algorithm is constant and only small parts change. Um, yeah. So they differ each other minorly, yeah, for sure. So the key thing here is once you and it's like you have a you have a coal supermarket and a woolly supermarket and they're not going to change and you know that statically like once you've created a new coal supermarket like that's it you know it doesn't suddenly go and become a woolly supermarket and this is going back to what we were saying before of static versus dynamic and to be honest like a what happened in the exam because it was the last term exam question um a lot of people went oh this is a strategy pattern because i have two options here and i have to pick one but it's not a strategy pattern because you once you're you know once you're one kind of supermarket you stay that way and there's no the, the key thing with the strategy pattern is that at runtime you can chop and change strategies you know like if we go back to the chess one uh where it was live stream notes yeah um you know we can start out with a and it's like okay we're gonna we're gonna decide to go to b and then we go back to a and then maybe we go to c depending on some sort of you know decision that's made by this game class um, the other example, like the one in the toot, is where we had the, the restaurant uh, charging system. And that was a strategy pattern because, you know, it's like on any given day, well, maybe it's a public holiday. And then maybe the next day it changes back to normal. And then at 6 p.m. it changes to be happy hour. So these are all different strategies. And you can, as I said, chop and change and move dynamically between strategies. Whereas in this checkout system, you don't you don't suddenly go from being calls to all words. So that's... Um, why it's not a strategy pattern. Uh, refactor it. Okay. So welcome the user. Well, what we're going to do is move this if statement into a method. So we'll call this. Um, we're going to say. See, this is kind of annoying because you want you want an abstract class, but we can't make this abstract. Um, in hindsight, I probably should have gone down the supermarket route, but let's just stick with what we have. Um, so we'll say public void. Actually, no, we are we are going to make a supermarket class. Sorry, I keep changing it. Um, public abstract class supermarket, and then this is going to be in here. Oh, actually, this isn't. Maybe call the supermarket checkout. Because you think, well, this doesn't really model the supermarket because we have an amount purchased, and that's specific to a particular you know, instance of checking out. So it's important that kind of classes are named in a way that makes semantic sense. Uh, what we'll also say, we'll have here a private supermarket and just make a, ooh, what should we do? Yeah, I see, okay. And then in this um, private constructor, what we'll say is if um, supermarket dot equals holes, um, We'll say supermarket. Oh, actually, we need to say this dot supermarket equals new polls. Otherwise, it's the Woolies. Um, polls cannot be resolved to a type. need to extend great and now we can just say string card name equals um, supermarket dot get card name 
and this is going to be defined as an abstract method in our checkout class. So public abstract get card name. And while we're here, we'll move this entire checkout method into the supermarket checkout class. And all we'll say is supermarket dot checkout items payment method. Oop. Yeah, payment method, payment amount, and receipt. All right, um, the get card name is undefined for the type string. I see, and we'll just call get card name. So now we can move this into the classes, and this is where the refactoring really starts, because um, we can just say, well, I'm going to add the unimplemented methods and return everyday rewards. and then return flybys. I'm not going to do this whole thing because it's just like at this point, it's going to turn into a lot of moving around code. Um, all I'll probably do is just like the skeleton. So in the scan items method, which we need to move from checkout system into our checkout class, Um, and again, for the design smells, you can talk about all this nesting and, you know, like you see lots of curly braces and I think, well, that's something that's potentially not good with the code. Um, again, here we've got uh, in the scan items method something that's dependent, so we can look at uh, what can we do? We can say, well, you know, int or int max items equals super or equals get max items, and then that will just return twenty or fifty five. And so we can remove all this if statement and just say, well, uh, too many items, or in this case, now we actually have to handle the behavior differently. So maybe instead of that, let's go well. Um, handle max items, pass in items, which is another abstractly defined method. That does all that. Um, and then this is common to both, so we can keep that in the superclass. And you kind of repeat this process for the remainder of the steps. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, so I, I'd rather spend this time talking about other concepts because just a lot of writing code otherwise. Um, are there any things people want to talk about topics wise? Uh, other things from the forum? Do, 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 do. Yeah. Any design patterns 
that you want me to kind of go over? To what extent we need to know parallelism? That's a good question. Um, the extent to which it's in the week eight lab, um, I would highly recommend watching Braden's, um, what's it called, the retrospective, where he talks about, like, just go through the solution, because I think that'll give you a good understanding of the concepts. Um, and do lab eight if you haven't already, because that's, um, yeah, that'd be helpful. What would the mark penalty be for choosing the wrong pattern? This is a good question. Um, so, like, let's say you, you were like, oh, okay, well, uh, for this this question, you're like, okay, we'll go down the strategy pattern route. You'd probably still end up producing code that's better than what we started with. Because you'd be moving functionality into classes and you, and like in your rationale, you'd say, oh, I've done a strategy pattern. Um, and you're still, like, the thing about design patterns is it's not really a case of, well, you have to use this template pattern or you have to use a strategy pattern. It's more a case of, like, here's some tools in your toolkit where that we've, you know, that we've kind of given you and you've just got to find the right time to apply them. And every so often it's like, you might have even implemented the template pattern, just called it a strategy pattern. And at that point it's like, well, is that, you know, is that really what's important? Just like that you got the name right? And what we really care about is that, you know, for, for this refactoring question, did you make the code better than it started out as? And did you understand how you did it? In terms of you know what refactoring steps did you take? How did you use a design pattern to um, to improve the quality of the code? So for this question, yeah, you'd still you could still probably get most of the marks for design even if you got the pattern wrong. Um, that being said, though, like if you I don't know if you're like oh this we could use a a decorator pattern here that'd be and, and then just like try to implement a decorator pattern like it probably wouldn't even work. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. How important is generics? Uh, I mean, it's like it's it's a kind that's a kind of question that's like it's hard to say how important something is like it's a part of it's part of the course it's part of java um we expect you to be familiar with them so there's no kind of you know it's not like 50 percent of the exam is going to be generics or whatever like there'll be some questions with generics in it there might be some questions in the short answer about generics and there'll definitely be something in about generics with the in the practical component um i mean like the thing with generics is you know anytime you use an array list like here that's that's generic, so it's a pretty broad concept. Um, just the exam as a whole, yeah. So 40% in the exam overall. Sorry, Liam, I know you, I don't know if you're here, but. I'll answer this question now. Um, pass in the entire class, for example, you. Lab 5, we don't pass in the browser. Actually, I might let Braden ask this question. Um, will the solutions to additional questions be released? Yes. Are they there already? I'll just double check, because I think we... Yeah, there's a solutions branch, um, which you can see here. Would you know the final number for marks before the exam? Uh, do you mean the like your all your marks up until the exam? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I think I mentioned this today in the notice is like we're going to wrap up all the marks um, over this weekend Monday and then we'll give you a field in your web TMS that says this is the score you need the score you need in the exam to pass the course which will 
either be 40. Um, yeah, it's okay. So that would either be 40 because, yeah, 40% because that's the hurdle, um, or it'll be something more than that if you haven't gotten the full uh, 60%. I can't, I don't, I don't know, I don't, my brain's my brain can't do math at this point, but yeah, that'll tell you the, the mark you need in the exam to pass. Uh, five, two, yeah, any kind of last questions, just push them through now. Otherwise, we can continue on the forums. Q1 sample exam, if we just answer observe pattern, uh, no, you probably get no marks, to be honest. Um, because I mean, you might get one mark if, depending on. Yeah, like you probably get one out of five because it's like, well, just identifying the pattern often isn't enough, and it's we we want to kind of you know get you to show your justification and understanding. How detailed do we need to get the full marks? This is a good question because. When we mark the short answer, um, you get people who they write, they write like, they write kind of mini essays, um, or they write like, yeah, as Matt said, they write a bunch of sentences, and it's kind of like what I was saying before, where you don't, it's not about you have to write five points to get five marks, you have to write X sentences. Um, yeah, there's a help session on Saturday, so um, you don't, it's not about like you have to write this amount to get the marks. It's did you hit all of the points we were looking for? And like in a five mark question, there might only be four points that we're looking for, but one thing is particularly important, so it's worth two marks. Um, and so yeah, when we're marking it, like you, some people write these these like mini essays, and they still they still only get like two out of five because they didn't, you know, it was, it was like four sentences of waffle, and none of the actual points we were looking for were in the answer. Whereas other people, I think, you know, I think I think I was marking the the Liskov question last term. This one. And someone answered the question. So like someone gave an answer that was um, I think it was about a sent it was like a sentence or two sentences, and it hit on every single point that we were looking for, and so it got four marks. So that's that's my like my comment on approaching the short answer is think of it less in terms of I have to write X, Y, Z. Yeah, dot points would be fine, to be honest. Um, I, prob I probably should encourage you to write in sentences because that's like, I don't know, better educational practice. But honestly, from a marking point of view, it's a lot easier to read dot points. Um, and particularly, like, if you struggle with English, then like dot point and you like it's easy to write dot points, then that's fine as well. Um, this isn't like a literature exam. Yeah. Just to reiterate, um, because I'm sure there'll be a couple of people who didn't read this page. There's no submit command. You just need to push your results to GitLab, your, sorry, your solutions to GitLab. Um, short answer, like don't forget to commit and add all your short answer files, all of your code that you've changed. Um, and please, 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 Commit and push as you go. Please do not wait until the end to submit to run git push um, because, I mean, there's a very high chance GitLab's going to crash towards the end of the exam anyway, just because it does. Um, hopefully it won't and I'll be proven wrong, but there's a reasonable chance it will. And if you're in the position of, you know, I can't push to GitLab and I haven't submitted anything, then that's, you know, that's, that's not great. So just push as you go. Like, do the short answer, push your short answer, and then as you complete individual parts of programming questions, push that as well. Um, any packages you need to install before the exams? No, so like there's no Gradle, there's no um, there's no things. All the packages that we require will give you like we've done in the sample exam. Um, will a sport extension be awarded if GitLab crashes? Potentially. Um, I'm sure pl plenty of you are social people and talk to people who did the course last term. Um, we'll, we'll make whatever decision needs to be made when, you know, if stuff happens, when stuff happens, and you won't be disadvantaged by GitLab crashing. Like if you, if you, if GitLab crashes and you can't submit your last question, then, you know, you wouldn't get 
you wouldn't we wouldn't just go oh you know you can't submit it sorry oh yeah the forum one five three one yep 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 ah uh tria asked a great question which is are there marks for writing good test cases not direct marks so it's not like the one five three one exam where you know we say 50 like 50 percent comes from implementation and x comes from coverage and x comes from your tests um but so we, we're not going to mark your tests but obviously if you write better tests and as hard as it is actually i don't know if, if, if you wanted to you could try and write a test first so like try and think of some edge cases like for the business rules question um we give you some pretty good tests but you could try and think of some more and then write a few tests and then implement it that's hard like um because you just kind of want to get into straight into programming stuff but i mean especially if, if you have time at the end then you know like if you've got extra time then just write more tests last term yep um yeah vlab should be fine i i mean i've never used vlab for an exam so i can't personally attest to anything but it should be okay i don't know if vlab gets slow during the exam time how much justification uh multiple choice oh okay sorry i missed this question Matt. would there ever need to be multiple criteria when you tip for each one yeah potentially um questions are like i don't know I, we might give you a question that's like well here's a problem which design pattern can you use um and here's you know four options and so then you might choose one option and there'd be a couple of points to, to back that up like the, this question here we could give you you know observer state strategy decorator and then you say observer because the same thing as before um yeah i guess also just because like um so hopefully like ease people's stress a bit the exam hopefully will not kind of happen the way things happened last term um because the infrastructure is quite different you know, you're submitting by GitLab and not by WebCMS. Because what happened last time was um, WebCMS crashed in the end because everyone was working locally. And so you can't run, like we had um, Gib submissions, which you're probably used to from other courses. And everyone had been working locally all term with GitLab. So they uploaded through WebCMS. WebCMS crashed. And then I think everyone was just kind of, I don't know, ready to finish. Um, yeah, and I think like the thing with exams and, and you know, we had this with the, the auto marking as well is stuff stuff inevitably goes wrong, right? And like, I mean, this is the same for you in exams where it's like stuff doesn't always go to plan and, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure at the end that no one's disadvantaged if it's a problem on our end. Um, and I think you know, like last term there was a question where one of the tests was broken or something. And so we awarded some extra time because of that. but. That, that's 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 on our end and like at the end of the day i would just focus on you doing your exam as best you can and don't like like let us do do what we do um and just focus on like understanding the concepts and being able to program under pressure and it'll all be fine yeah uh it's 504 so um i'm sure you all have an evening to get to Thanks everyone so much for coming. Again, uh, this exam proctored. How do you guys know people? Okay, that's, that's a, Sophie asked a great question um, just to finish up. Thanks everyone. So I'm going to be fully honest. We, you know, we're, we're not we're not going to be monitoring your computers to see if you Google stuff, and because we can't. Now that doesn't mean you should Google stuff. Because we've said that, what do we say? All you can access is GitLab, the course material, and the Java API. And that really, at the end of the day, should be all you need. Because, I mean, I've said, I said this all the time, but it's like sites like Refactoring Guru, um, you know, they're, they're, they're useful for understanding one way, to, one way to go about patterns. And, um, yeah, so they're useful to understand one way to go about patterns, but they're not, you know, the, the, they won't be necessarily 
the solution to you? Like the business rules question. I don't. I wouldn't say you can just kind of look at that and go, oh, okay, well, I'm going to look at refactoring Guru, and that's going to tell me how to do the solution. Like it's not that helpful. You just kind of have to use your brain and, and figure it out. Um, so in that sense, like the internet's not super helpful. Um, and in terms of stuff like you're like, oh, I didn't memorize, I don't know, what contravariance was and covariance was, and there was a question on it, and then you know, you're like, oh, okay, I'll just, I'll just look that up in the lecture notes. Yeah, um, and, and the stuff about, I like, you know, each course kind of runs differently. Um, you obviously can't communicate with anyone during the exam, and without going into too much detail, part of why you can only visit certain websites is because lines get quite blurry when you start to say you can visit websites. That's all I'll say on it. Um, yeah, I mean, like everything, everything you need to look up should be in the course material or the Java API. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's most of the questions on that. Um, keep asking on the forum. Um, and I would just like highly recommend do do as much kind of practice it, you know, sitting down programming and thinking about design questions and going, okay, what pattern should I use here? Um, and try and do that across all the patterns because once you've gotten exposed to everything, then you've kind of you know left no stone unturned. Um, yeah. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks for an awesome term. I really am looking forward to, to T1 next year when people are back on campus and I hope to, to see you around. Please come and say hi um, and good luck. Uh, I'm, I'll see you, you know, around on, on Wednesday when we have the exam, when we do the announcements and that sort of thing. But you'll do great. Thanks everyone. And I'll stop recording.